Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really nice to, to have the opportunity to, to share with the community some of the work that we are doing in the Holoruminan project. As you already mentioned, Holoruminan is one of, uh, of the new incorporation to the Eurofan project. And have the particularity together with the 3D omics project that uh, is not focused only on the host, but also on the uh, microbiome. So my name is Julie Axis. Um, I will be talking today about the project, but I'm not the coordinator of the project. The project is coordinated by Diego Morgabi. And as you will see later, involve many institutions. First at all, because uh, I really don't know how many people uh, uh, know IRTA, I have one slide to introduce, not myself, but the team in which I'm working with. IRTA is a research institute that uh, works in agronomical science. And in particular, uh, I am working in the animal breeding and genetic teams, which is located close to Barcelona in Torre Marimón. In our team, we are mainly geneticians and we have expertise in different fields of animal production, quantitative and population genetics, uh, computational biology, and uh, statistical and data managers. So the institution is, is this very nice building. And we have, uh, in addition to our facilities, experimental facilities for uh, to do wet lab, we have also uh, experimental farms. The one of the experimental farms we work mainly with rabbits and pigs, but one of the farms is close to the, this building and the northern big facility, experimental facility, is located here in Girona. So going back to the presentation, um, the presentation is divided in two main steps. The first one is a general introduction uh, to explain a little bit a few concepts regarding the microbiome and host evolution and also trying to show where we are, um, the resort that are by label uh, regarding the host microbial interaction and how we plan to contribute from the Holoruminan project to the current state of the art. The revision includes not only uh, biological component, but also some elements that I think could be probably interested for, for the NFCOR initiative like, for instance, the public available resource in terms of database and computational biology files that are using. Not only for metagenome, but also, but mainly for metagenome in this case, sorry. So why we are interested in microbiome in first, in first place? So probably you note that there is a growing interest regarding the use of microbiome information in human, plant, and environmental science, but also in animals. Actually, we know from the from scientific evidence that a microbiome could be a one important component and actually is one important component that may help to improve livestock sustainability by, for instance, reducing the environmental impacts of livestock production by discovering new bioactive metabolites that perhaps can be used as alternative to the antibiotics, therefore uh, helping with the current crisis we have regarding the antibiotic resistant genes and in general, uh, improving animal health and welfare, but not only animal health and welfare, but from one health perspective, also impacting positive the human health and environmental science. One thing I, I always uh, like to, to highlight when we are talking about uh, the current state of the art in microbial research, if that somehow is not very different, the evolution to uh, how uh, has been evolving order omics data set. I mean, from one side, um, the key question is to try to understand the relationship between the environment cause and the microbiome, which is bidirectional, as you can see here. And to do that, uh, we first need, we need to follow a process which is similar to how the genomics was developed. For instance, in the beginning, and, and sorry, and all this is important. Why? Because one difference uh, that uh, the microbial uh, community have regarding the genomics studies is the possibility to modulate it, to be modulated. The genome is the information we get from our parents, and yes, could be modulated, but uh, we are not there yet 
definition could be edited, but the microbiome, as previous mentioned, is associated and is important for many different parts of the physiology, biology of the animals, and can be modulated. So it's a tool that can be actually used and is being currently used in, in livestock production. But to go there, we need to first uh, transit for several steps. The first one is not very different to, to the one uh, as was doing in, in genomics and is first starting the collection of uh, catalogs, like for instance, a reference catalog of different species. There are some examples, for instance, the air microbiome project or the project uh, regarding the human microbiome as well. Then when we have a good catalog, we start to, to asking different questions of how uh, this uh, microbial population are associated with different traits and a good example that uh, demonstrate this natural evolution is for instance, the second part of the human microbiome project in which once they have a, a, the catalog, then they start to asking for this kind of question, trying to answer this kind of question, looking for instance, for the association between the microbiome and different diseases in human and also to just to mention some example in, in animals breeding, in animal production, we have a initiative like the holoruminant and the free deomics that uh, try to go deeper on that, not only in the bacteria or, or the microorganisms that are there, but also mainly in the functional role they are playing in order to be able to, to modulate it and be able to use and incorporate it as tools in animal breeding. Um, for all these studies, in particular in human, we know that the main driver of the microbial, microbial composition in human are the diet and the lifestyle. And in this particular case, uh, there is also evidence that the host genetic <clears throat> or host genetic factor play just a minor role. But I think we are all agree that when we are working with uh, livestock, we can do better in the way that there are many factors that differentiate a livestock production of human population. One of them uh, is obvious, the domestication, the dietary control, the breeding program, and the environmental control. All these uh, together um, reduce most of the environmental variants that impact the holobiums and therefore uh, facilitate some consequence to, to modulate the microbiome. And all this uh, results in, in a terminology that is the partner of fidelity. Basically, this terminology evaluates uh, how strong is the association between the host and the microbiome across generation. And as a result of all these factors, the partner fidelity in animals is stronger than in human. Therefore, uh, one thing that is important also to mention is that this, uh, I will say, it, a strong dependency between the host and the microbiome is not uniform across the animal tree for life, but in the top we have ruminants. Um, and ruminants are indeed a good example of a strong dependency and actually a obligatory relationship between the host and the microbiome dating back uh, 50 million years ago. And we can think, and many authors already uh, claim, that this higher dependency may play a role, one evolutionary role, on, on the relationship between the host and the microbiome. And this is actually one opportunity to study uh, the, the, the interaction between the host and the microbiome. And just to, to mention one example, um, for, the, for the ruminant, the microbiome is, is essential because, um, for instance, the, the host get up to the 80% of the total energy from the metabolism of the ruminal microbiome. And these microorganisms are also necessary for the, for the digestion of uh, some uh, fiber that are not could be digested by the host and also for the synthesis of some essential vitamins. In fact, if you think that the ruminant without the rumen is something like this, uh, I have to say that no, a ruminant without the rumen looks more like like this picture. So it's really, really important. Still, if we look at the literature for some strategies uh, trying to modulate the ruminal microbiome, 
um, we will see that most of them are strategies based only on a nutritional strategy, basically trying to use either prebiotics or probiotics to modulate the microbiome to reduce, for instance, the methane emission of any particular um, negative impacts of the, of the ecosystem. However, there are very, very few uh, studies focused on other component that is, is also important and is the genetic component of the host control on the microbiome composition. And why we think it's important to, to check at this? Well, because from one side, if a host already have a, a way to regulate the, the microbiome, then a better understanding of these me mechanisms uh, could offer uh, one alternative to targeting the microbiome in addition to the nutritional strategy. And from the other side, uh, as previous mentioned, this uh, relationship uh, has evolutionary implications. So it is important to try to better understand that. Uh, when look uh, at this a small proportion of the studies that are already looking to this, we can see that in fact, both in, in dairy, but also in chip, the, there is a proportion of microorganisms that are heritable. And it's important to mention here that this definition do not imply that any component of the microbiome uh, is transmitted vertically from the parent to the offspring, but simply uh, claim that there is one association between the host genotype and the microbiome composition. And it's this kind of heritability uh, or heritable microbiomes uh, has been also reported in monogastric, um, but uh, focus on ruminants, which is the main uh, uh, topic of the whole ruminant project, I would like to go a little bit deeper on this study. Here is uh, one study that uh, resolved from the previous European project, the ruminomics project. And that was quite interesting because uh, there have samples from seven different farms across different countries in Europe. And actually, they were able to identify a core microbiome that uh, was common across different far farms uh, in respect that the farm has different diet and so on. And was, that was interesting here is that uh, all these um, heritable microbiomes that were present across farms were phylogenetic related. There are not many in number, but on the abundance, represent up to the 60% of the overall abundance of the ecosystem and were associated with host phenotypes. Like, for instance, the methane emission is, uh, I think, is a clear example because methane is produced by the methanogenic archaea, but there also demonstrated association with other trade like milk composition, for instance. Um, Three years later, another study, this time focused on beef cattle. So from the genetic point of view, it's very different. Dairy cattle and beef cattle are quite different. Uh, confir confirm the heritable nature of some of these uh, core components. And also show that um, actually uh, the member of the microbiome, not only at taxonomic okay. level, but also okay. at functional level, uh, where also associated with uh, intramuscular fat content, which is a trait uh, of meat quality trait. We use it in beef cattle. And as you can imagine, um, from as geneticians uh, and microbiome enthusiasts, for us, that was a fantastic news because this does, these two independent studies and other studies I'm not mentioned here clearly show that the microbiome uh, meet two important criteria to be considered into breeding programs. So there are some part of the microbiome is heritable and are associated with host trait. Now we can start thinking on a strategy to include this information in breeding program as well. Um, regarding also the genetic basis, there are also few studies uh, looking for association between the host genome and the microbiome composition. As you can see, it, there are not that many. I think there are only eight studies that reflecting that it's a new field um, and it's something that uh, is ongoing. But um, what is uh, interesting here is that um, in some of the studies, they demonstrate, like for instance, the one of Lee et al., which was the first one, 
that almost the 34% of the microbial taxa was also associated with. However, when we start to look at this study uh, in order to incorporate this information in the Holoruminan project, we realize that, uh, and I will like to illustrate this using a graphical representation in which this study is a node and the shape of the node illustrate whether the study use either beef cattle or dairy cattle. The size of the node is uh, proportional to the sample size and the color illustrate the, the tissue. It's easy to see that most of the study has been done uh, looking to the ruminal microbiome alone. There is one of them that check not only for, uh, for the fecal microbiota, and the studies are connected if they are using the same taxonomy database. So, but then looking deeper on the studies, we realize that most of them use different bioinformatic pipelines. So we know that the fact that using different taxonomy data set and different bioinformatic pipeline um, increase the methodological heterogeneity, which is a limitation for the interstudy compatibility. So a uh, first key message of my presentation today is the real need that we have on the standardization of methodology if we want to, to go deeper on that, because we know this is a limitation, not only for metagenomics, but uh, in this case, we're talking about metagenomics. Another problem we realize from the current state of the R is the sample size. Most of these studies were done with a small sample size, and this is an issue if we want to detect a small effect. All the studies agree that the microbial composition is extremely polygenic trait, meaning that we will need, by sure, larger uh, data set and standardized uh, data set if we want to go deeper on that. Then, regarding the public database, there are, again, not that many. So there is plenty of uh, sequence data available, but in most of the case, there is no metadata, so we cannot use. The only section are the one you see on the screen. From one side uh, is a gene catalog of reference that we did. It's something uh, we did when I was doing the postdoc at France in collaboration with the BGI in China and also in collaboration with the INRA. Um, basically, this catalog is public available, so can be used. All the information is there, including the metadata and so on. And there is also an order catalog, but this time is a catalog of metagenome assembling genome that is managed by the MBI. What they have in common? Well, both of them only include information from the bacteria and the archaea. Therefore, ignore one important component of the microbial ecosystem, which is the eukaryotic community, I mean the fungi and the protozoa. In addition to that, um, there are plenty of bioinformatic tools. Here I just mentioned some of them from the NEF core. Um, the first one is not really uh, designed only for metagenome, but uh, I would like to highlight because I'm using to recover public information uh, in the Holoruminan project. And these two uh, are tools that can be used for this one for profile the metataxonomic data set. And this one, the taxa profile for profiling the shotgun metagenomics. There are also tools not only for profiling, but for the novel assembly. I'm using a lot the MAC, not in the Holoruminum, but in my own projects working with PICS. And there is also the metadenop, which is, can be used also in this case. The MAC is mainly thinking for uh, metagenome assembly from metagenomics alone. And the meta de novo is mainly designed for the metatranscriptomic analysis, the novo metatranscriptomic. And in order to go further on the functional classification, there is also this tool, the fun scan. So all these tools are available in, in the list of pipeline of the NEFCore initiative and can be used. So taking all this in consideration within the Holoruminan project, is a project. Um, that uh, involves 25 partners, not only from Europe, but also for, for the state, Canada, Israel, and Australia. Um, we plan to characterize the establishments and the dynamics of ruminant microbiome, because I forget to mention, but one important limitation of the current state of the art is in, in most of the case, the studies are done in a single point. 
and the microbiome are dynamics, as you can imagine. But most of the studies are ignoring that. In Holoromian, we want to, to consider this uh, to try to determine the connectivity between microbiome, not only from the rumen, because most of the studies, again, are focused only in the rumen, but we want to also sampling different body size, uh, try to go deeper if we can standardize all the data set on the genetic basis and the association with the key performance index. And when I say key performance index, I mean phenotypic information, okay? And um, why not to try to facilitate the adoption of the uh, results by the farmers? So the project is divided in seven work packages. Um, today I have no time to explain all of them, but one thing I want to highlight is that work packages two and work packages three are the one in, in which the experiment is being done. Work packages two is mainly focused on the uh, following the samples, the colonization and the developmental stage. So it's longitudinal, as you can imagine. And the work package three is also longitudinal and is focused mainly in different challenges. For instance, trying to, to see the evolution across different diseases when you have uh, healthy um, disease samples, uh, for instance, or, or particular scenarios. And today, I considering the, the, the meeting, the, the goal of the meeting, I would like to explain a little bit uh, most of the work done in work package one and work package four, which are the work packets focused on the analysis. The work package one is coordinated by Chris from the Queen's University of Belfast and basically uh, have four different tasks that, in my opinion, are really, really important. The first one, as I already mentioned before, we have a problem with the, the standardization. So the first task is focused on the standardization of the methodology. Uh, the second task is the consolidation of metataxonomic studies, public available, data public available. And that's, that's why I previously said that there is plenty of data set, but in most of the case, we cannot use because we have the sequence, but not the metadata. So it's, it's really it's bad. Um, the consolidation of microbial genome, so the same idea, but no focus only on cysting S, but on shotgun metagenomics, and the generation of novel data set. I mean, when I say novel data set, I'm talking, I mean, the data set that is generated in work packet uh, using the sample from work packet two and work packet four. Um, this is not only data set from metagenomics, but also from functional, for instance, metaproteomics and metatranscriptomics as well. Then in the work packet four, which is led by Phil, Phil is now, he's, he moved from Norway to Australia. And we have also four different tasks. The task, the first task is focused on, again, on the generation of metaproteomic data set. Then the idea, basically, the main idea of this work package is to integrate the information and uh, put all together uh, expertise in ecological and genetics in order to try to better understand the interaction between the host of the microbiome. That's why, as you can see here, in addition to, to the metaproteomic data set, most of the other tasks are associated with a specific question, like network analysis that will be done uh, in Norway, but also a constraint-based model. And in my case, uh, together with ICSI from Israel, uh, we are leading the tasks 4.4, which is uh, focused on the identification of microbial biomarker. I mean, microorganisms that are associated with the phenotypic trait, but also trying to go deeper on the genetic basis of microbiome using classical genetic quantities, but also running GWAS and meta-analysis. For the tax 4.1, the idea is to try to get a high quality metagenome assembling genomes. Why? Well, because uh, there is plenty of information, but uh, we want to, to provide better information in regarding not the quantity, but the quality, and also try to go deeper on the functional genomic information, which is limited. I mean, metatranscriptomic and metaproteomic across different body sites. And another thing that is, we believe is, is, is relevant, is important, is try to generate eukaryotic genomes, not only genomes from bacteria and archaea, uh, but it is a challenge, actually, you know, um, a challenge for many reasons. The first one is um, because uh, compared with bacteria, the protozoa and the fungi are, the abundance is lower. 
in, a, in addition to that, the genomic context also matter here. They, there is, they have microchromosome and IAT content, which make difficult the, the assembly using, even using high C technologies. And I have one experience that uh, I know that people like to show good result, but I, I will show no good result. I think it's important also. <laughs> so here the idea was to, we get from the cryobank of INRA, three different protozoa. So we, we say, uh, strand the DNA, do the sequencing, and did a hybrid sample, assembly using nanopore technology and Illumina technology as well. Once we have the, the, the data, we did the taxonomic classification and also the novel assembly. And for, for our surprise, we get a taxonomic level, as you can see, most of them are bacteria. So at MAC level, the same. So we was able to recover for 136 high quality max, but all of them for bacteria, no any, no a single one from, from protozoa. So it's really a challenge, but uh, we have a plan B. And there is this study from two years ago. In, in this study, they use a very different pipeline, basically integrating single cell uh, sequency uh, with other technologies. And they were able to recover very nice genomes of protozoa. So our plan B is to use this genome as a reference and try to map against the genome. Or I'm not sure if we can do it in the frame of the project, but in the future, try to follow a pipeline similar to this one and see if we can recover uh, protozoa from the data set we are generating. Um, going to the task 4.4, which is the task in which I involve. So as previously mentioned, the idea here is to identify a microbial biomarker and try to go deeper on the genetic basis of microbiome. To do that, uh, we will work with two different data sets. From one side, we have um, 500 samples. And for these 500 samples, there are samples that will be generated in Word Packet 2 and Word Packet 3. We will get functional information, uh, metaproteomic, metataxonomic, and high quality max. So we plan to put all this together and try to see if uh, we can, by using integrative approach, we can identify and better understand the biological me mechanism regarding the association between a particular uh, microorganism and a phenotypic information. From another side, for the GWAS analysis, we have a larger data set, but it's mainly focused on metataxonomy. And the idea here is to, to use the data set that will be generated in the frame of the project together with uh, 1,000 samples from the previous promenomic project and try to see if there is any uh, association between the host genome and the microbiome or why not if uh, any particular case on a microorganism that is identified previously is also associated using one independent data set. Um, for, for this, the, the expected outcomes of the project, and here I, I just want to, to highlight that I'm talking only of the outcome from work packets one and work packet four, because the other work packets have a more biological question, which is very interesting anyway, and actually are generating the data we will use. So we expect to generate a database we call HoloR, and a repository with all the pipeline we use, a standardized pipeline that make public in order that try to, to help the, our colleagues, either from the academia or the enterprise as well, and try to transfer this uh, knowledge to the public, uh, to the person. And also um, a repository of high quality max from Procaryote by Chur, and we will see if we can generate also from the Procaryote community. Uh, uh, from the World Packet 4, we plan also to, to reveal a uh, microbial signature associated with uh, different phenotypes. And regarding the host genetic component, uh, we are really interested in looking for host genetic with a main focus on pleiotropic variants. When I and I put it in red uh, because one of the of the expected token here is that uh, imagine if you can identify uh, some SNPs in the host genome that are associated with 
uh, beneficial microbiome, but also with a uh, trait of interest. This is really, really nice if we want to propose that this is need be incorporated in breeding schemas. But we need to be careful because we know from pigs studied that sometimes the same mutation could be beneficial in one context, for instance, associated with the abundance for the particular genera, but detrimental in another context. And we need to be careful with this. And uh, why not uh, try to provide new insights into the mechanism driving host microbial interaction as well. Also, uh, thinking on, on the expected outcome, um, we will we hope we can contribute to the open debate that about how to include a multi-omics data set on the breeding schemas. And th there is a open de debate right now on this. And regarding also the gene regulation, a, a topic which is quite recent and in my opinion is quite important as well, is to try to understand uh, something that uh, the people recently defined, like the my epigenome microbiome axis, is basically the bidirectional relationship between the metabolites that are produced by the microbiome and the epigenome in the host. So I think there is a lot of room here for for do really really exciting uh, words, and we will see where we go with the project and with the uh, knowledge generated by it. And this is all I want to, to share with you today. I just want to thank for the attention and also thanks to, to all the partners of the Holy Roman project. If you want to know more about the project, you can see here in the, in the link, there is a plenty of information and I hope you enjoy the, the presentation. And if you have any question, I will be more than happy to answer it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. Do we have any questions? Um, yes, Patrick. Uh, I think anyone well, can unmute them. Ulexis, thanks a lot for this uh, very nice and uh, very inspiring talk. We've been uh, we're just coming out of Bovreg and uh, Bovreg and uh, uh, we can easily forget that most of the genes in the cow are actually uh, bacterial genes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very refreshing. <laughs> now I have uh, I have very very simple and naive questions. So uh, do we know why this is irritable? Do we have uh, do we have any idea of the physiology of the irritability? Uh, yes, actually I was waiting for this. One second. You see? <laughs> <laughs> we so, did not uh, rehearse. Eh? <laughs> no, 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 I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, as I previously mentioned, is uh, this suggests that um, there is a mechanism on that. And in when we see uh, about the, the, the putative mechanisms that we that you can see easily is that most of the genes that are associated with the microbial abundance are genes from the immune system. And that makes sense somehow because the relationship between the immune system and the microbiome is uh, again by the directional. And it's something common not only in ruminant. Uh, there is a very nice revision about that, and they show that across different animals. The, the one that always came is the immune system. And in the particular case also of the ruminants, some of the genes that are reported by disease studies are also uh, genes that are associated with the morphology of the rumen, which makes sense again, you know? So it's not like a direct relationship. In my opinion, it's more indirect throughout some uh, biological mechanics like the immune system or the morphology of the the, the rumen and, and so on. And then I have a question following on this. So uh, mm -hmm. a big thing in, in all mammals at least and possibly vertebrates, I don't know, is the uh, the, uh, the 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 process taking place in the thymus, making sure that you can recognize self and non-self. Are some of these bacteria <laughs> included in the self? Are, are they, do they, are some of these antigens making their way to the thymus to make sure that they do not become the target of our immune system? Do you know this? Uh, so I know that the, the mechanism is quite complex. For instance, uh, a, a, a good 
a way to to see this is, for instance, that there is um, the TLR. I forget now the name, but it's actually associated. It's quite related with the, your question, I think. And indeed, it's, it's it's associated with the recognition patterns from the host, basically. Is what mm -hmm. what I want to say. It. And yeah, uh, but you know, there is also a recent evidence that the relationship is not that simple. For instance, there are a couple of studies. Uh, demonstrating that actually uh, a structural variant from the host, like open number variants, play a role as well. So it's, 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 it's quite complex. And there is something that um, for me is, is, is at least curious, once again, we'll go very fast to the slide of the human study, because I think it's not a coincidence. Eh? You will see. Uh, where are you? As you can see here in the in the list of candidate genes, that are there are not that many, but all of them are associated with uh, signatures of, of of adaptation in human. You see, for instance, uh -huh. this one is the the one for the lactato. This one is the amylase, which is a copy number variant, by the way. You know, so I think it's not a coincidence. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think it's not it's not a coincidence. That's very interesting. And yeah. uh, because uh, you were mentioning that Irta is close to Girona, which is getting very, very dry these days, fortunately mm -hmm. less now. So how, uh, what is the relation between the microbiote and adaptation to dryness? For instance, uh, we read these days that uh, camel milk is becoming a thing because mm -hmm. uh, in big chunks of Africa, camels are replacing cows to produce milk. Is uh, Well, there are obvious physiological adaptive traits in camels, but uh, does some of this adaptation pertain to, to the microbiome? Is there, is there any evidence in this direction? Mm, so I'm not working with camel, but uh, we are actually evaluating in a different project, not in the holoruminant, the effect of uh, some environmental stress situation. And it's, it's, it's true that um, this kind of situation can shape the microbiome. So mm -hmm. I assume yes, but uh, I really don't know because I'm not working with Camille. Yeah. Okay. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. But it's a good question, actually, Cedric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have uh, any other question for you, Yuliakis? Yuliaxis? Yuliaxis, yeah. <laughs> Yuliaxis, sorry. It's uh -huh. challenging <laughs> for a French. <laughs> yeah, Bobin. <laughs> ah, yeah. Nice, nice talk, uh, Yuliaxis. Uh, my mm -hmm. question is relating to the genetics. Like, uh, is there any studies that uh, relates the, uh, I mean, direct genetic interaction? For example, the epigenetic changes in the host when, when there is the composition of microbiomes or something like that. In uh, human, yes. In human, yes. The okay. the one I show in the end, I think, I if you are interested on that, which I think is a really nice topic, uh, I highly recommend the, this. This paper, actually, it's a paper from two weeks ago or something like that. I was preparing the, the, the presentation, and I, I always like to go back to the literature, you know, and I saw it, and it's, it's amazing. This one, you see, this okay. is a, a revision of that topic, which is uh -huh. really, really fantastic, fantastic, in my opinion. In in animals, it should be. I'm sure they are having a talk, you know, the, the epigenetic and the microbiome. Um, yeah, but, I think it's I, really an interesting uh, uh, topic to investigate. Like. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, it's uh, through the metabolite. There is uh, yeah. the, the most evidence are for a metabolite. The name is butyrate. Mm -hmm. The butyrate calcium, sorry. And there is a lot of evidence uh, demonstrating, but it's not only butyrate. It's, it's quite complex. I, yeah. I okay. really, really recommend this uh, this study okay. if you're interested. On. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I mean, it's a stupid question, but uh, I have often challenged my students saying that uh, if there is life in outer space, they have labeled us as uh, mobile bacterial growing devices. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I would just like to know your, because you probably have an idea on this, what is the ratio of the biomass produced by the microbiote versus biomass produced by the animal during its lifetime? Mm. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know, Cedric. <laughs> But I, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. But because that's the thing, you know, um, uh, as I show you in the, the, the slide regarding the dependency, the dependency varied a lot between different animals. So it's, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Because <laughs> I have the impression in cow or maybe even uh -huh. in human, we, you know, our bacteria 
through the recycling produce more biomass than we do no? through, through our entire probably, life? <laughs> probably, yes, because uh, you get uh, in the room and it's, it's full of uh, microbiome, yeah. but you so, go fast, so everywhere. So, so more, 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 they have more gene than us. Yeah. <laughs> they are more numerous than us. Yeah. <laughs> and they weigh <laughs> more than us. So we're yeah. just, we, 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 we're just a, a container. <laughs> yeah. You know, a, a good example, going back to the question of the space, is that in the just in the gut, we have a large number of microorganisms that starts in the in the Via Lactea, you know? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> And so uh, re reorienting this discussion a little bit more towards NF core. So mm -hmm. you 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 nicely selected a few NF core pipelines, which I think mm -hmm. is great. Uh, um, is it uh, out of courtesy or is NF core really a, 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 a nice shopping place featuring everything you need, or, or no. are there gaps? No, it's not a courtesy because um, it's, they are tools that I'm using in my national project. In the case of Holorumina, and they're very useful, by the way. So thank you for that, for doing that uh, to the community in general. Um, in the case of Holorumina, the problem we have, and is I don't know, is Daniel is, is there? No, he's not. Because Daniel is the Daniel Fisher is the the coordinator of the Bioinfo in in the project. And we was discussing in the consortium, and the problem we have is that um, we want to to create a, a pylon that put all together. I show the different pylon and what they can do. There are different, obviously. And the main idea of the project is to have a a workflow that do everything in a single step. You know, and that's why uh, uh, we are trying to develop this from the scratch. But I think. In my personal experience working with uh, metagenomics, either metataxonomics of Chorgang, the tools that are available in NEFCOR uh, are really, really, really uh, useful and really, really help me a lot with my national project, you know? Mm -hmm. This is very nice to hear. And also yeah. something to bear in mind, and that's an ongoing trend now. You know, NFCOR is many things, it's two things. NFCOR is a collection mm -hmm. of tools, and these are some of those you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's also a standout to make sure that the tools are interoperable. For instance, we have seen that the Sanger now host their own Nextflow tools under an umbrella that is not the NF Core umbrella. It means they don't have to talk with us when they decide to do a new pipeline and when they want to change it. But from what I understand, they are also using the NF Core standout because it's a good standout. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also have all the nanopore tools that have been next floor for a long time and you know for reason i understand these people did not want to be under the nf core umbrella but they mm -hmm. are still very very closely associated with the standard and all this kind of thing so it's important to have in mind that uh, mm -hmm. there is a galaxy of tools around these things and you're saying you're saying thank you no you should not you should thank yourselves because mm -hmm. uh, it really is a it's a, it's not a gimmick. It really is a community effort. So all of these tools have really been developed by the community. And uh, you guys uh, are very, very welcome to become contributors for any gaps that you will encounter in the tools. And that's really the, the, the spirit of this channel, of this special interest group channel that we opened a few months ago now, is really that all of us come together and identify gaps, identify mm -hmm. issues, and uh, specific targets of the work on, on, on farmed animals and, 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 and related topics, so that all these things will be addressed. So uh, in the months to come, we will start, uh, we will very soon launch a call for roundtables topics, you know, a topic we're trying to bring together four or five people with the same interest and having a discussion after the talk. And so it seems to me that uh, gaps in, uh, in, uh, in, in microbiome analysis will, will, will certainly be a, an interesting topic, no? Yeah, yeah, we're very happy to contribute. And actually, I think it's important to, to work on the diffusion of a tool because they're, they're actually include the gold standard tools for metagenomics analysis and are repetitive also, you know, better than me, the, the adventures of the NetFlow and NetCore. But many people still don't know. So I'm, I'm doing my best to try to, to get to the community and to say, hey, we have this resource, which is amazing, so let's use it. And let's improve it as a community. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of the things that came out when we were doing Bovrec, and that was a nice discovery, is that uh, 
And this goes back to the origin of Nextflow. Nextflow was developed in a small lab. And this is not something where we had the money to train people and all these kind of things. And unsurprisingly, Nextflow was really very rapidly caught up by other small labs because they didn't have the resources to do very, very fancy stuff and they needed the stuff to work. And when we wrote the, 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 the FANG NF Core paper, that, uh, that, that, that was posted on BioArchive not so long ago, we found that one of the reasons for the addition to Nextflow is that it's easy. You can do it gradually. You can move gradually from Bash to Nextflow and from Nextflow to NF Core, and all of these things are gradual. And you're still, you still get results that are usable even if you have not moved entirely to NF Core. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing that... Uh, that, uh, that that is important, and also uh, I see that Jose has just posted on the on the chat a reminder that uh, we mm -hmm. will have the next flow submit in uh, in uh, at the end of uh, October, and so of course anyone wanting to contribute on the work they have done on NF Core is is welcome to attend and 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 to uh, to send us to send an abstract. The call for abstract is still open for a few days, I think. Thank you, Jose. The call for abstract is also until Friday. Yes, yeah. until this Friday, next Friday. Yeah. Um, one short, quick question uh, with respect to the standardization. You mentioned uh, several studies that use different analysis, which highlights the need for a standardization. But is there any information on some kind of a benchmarking, basically an analysis that checks how different the results from uh, these different analysis are? Yeah, there are some of them. Uh, wrong. I, I can share with you later if you are interested in that, but there are actually there are some of them, yeah. Okay. And I do also yeah. benchmarking, independent of benchmarking, because you know, the field is moving so fast and there are new tools amazing tools there, but I, I, as, as curiosity, I will say, it, I will always like to have an individual independent benchmarking, you know? Yeah, yeah, but there are some papers. 